the, the movement that I'm interested in is called, and there's a lot of names around it, but it's re-decentralizing re the web, or in the web camp. Um, and we call it Reclaim Your Domain. And at the heart of that movement is a thinking about how the pendulum has swung so far towards kind of uh, massive uh, systems like Facebook, social media, that kind of uh, are mining our data, are controlling who we are, our notions of identity. And people like Amber Case, who's part of the indie web camp, are saying that, that pendulum needs to be swinging back now. And we need to think about where that data lives and how we control it and who we are online. And so it's an interesting conversation that's happening outside of higher ed uh, in many ways. But there are points at which what's happening with what Femtech Net, what I think DS106 is, uh, aspires to be, stuff like the man of one's own, really hit on core parts of that. So what I want you to think with Connected Courses is it's not just us in this room. There's a culture out there that's thinking hard about this across disciplines and across domain. And so possibly us moving and reaching out to them as well might be a good move more generally. Um, that said, I want to bring you back to a little bit of why I'm probably here, why DS106 happened, why I lost more of my hair than I intended to over the last four years. Um, there was 2009, 2010, uh, this idea called EduPunk that was written about in this book by Anya Kamenetz kind of took off. And it took on a life that I don't necessarily feel like it reflected what it had intended to do. One of the ways I'd see that is there was a post in the Taiyi, which is a Canadian magazine that talked about edupunks as useful idiots. People who were gutting the system in order to allow all these for-profits to move in. And it was a pretty articulate argument. And I never really got over that idea that I was part of the problem <laughs> and that I was defining the very conditions in some ways uh, of the system. And that's obviously a little bit egocentric because I wasn't. It wasn't that big a deal. It was much smaller. But that really, this idea of being a useful idiot hurt. Mm -hmm. And so I moved away from the idea of edupunk altogether, and we moved into this vision of what if we don't call it anything that people can kind of capitalize on? What if what we're doing is not necessarily a philosophy and a lot of grandiose kind of speaking, although I do think the philosophy is essential, I'm not trying to downplay that, but what if we start to put into practice some of the ideas behind Gardner Campbell's notion of the personal cyber infrastructure? The idea that every person can build and manage their own space online and become a sysadmin of their own education. It's a dream, but more and more the tools make it possible. At the same time, this idea of the MOOC before it blew up, the ones that Siemens and Downs and Cormier had done in 2008, 2009, those were very much in my imagination when I first started DS106 in 2010, spring. DS-106 in 2010 was a very different course than it was a year later, and I'll talk about why. But I did have course objectives. That doesn't often happen with courses I teach. <laughs> but I came back to this idea that I gotta sell, much like you, Helen, I have to sell a computer science class. That's a literature course, because that's my background, and I have to kind of say why. And it was called digital storytelling. So the why for DS-106 was actually to your point, Mike, yesterday was running a lot of what I've done. We need to develop skills using technology as a tool for networking, sharing, narrating that whole idea of social capital as part of the outcome. The frame of digital identity, wherein you become both a practitioner and interrogator of the various new modes of the network or networking. And then to critically examine the digital landscape of communication, which for me, as a cultural studies person, as coming out of lit, was essential. And think about these emergent narrative forms and genres. But none of these ever really spoke at all to what we did in the class in terms of what the assignments were, what the class looked like, what we asked them to do. They were just these whys that kind of undergirded a lot of the vision behind DS-106 is first and foremost about interrogating a space that very few disciplines are right now. And the way in which we wanted to do that was we wanted to actually give people a sense of their own infrastructure, a sense of controlling a bit of who they are. Now, I'm not going to go through this, and this is a complicated presentation that Martha Burtis, who is very much 
a co-conspirator and a co-architect for a lot of the early stuff. And I'm sorry she's not here, but unfortunately for her, she's in Hawaii on a two-week vacation. So I feel really bad for her right now. Okay, but this is something we came up with, which I thought was really interesting. And it was a presentation we did, and it was a, a PowerPoint presentation where all these links linked to different slides. They actually were linking, and you'll notice, and we've been talking about this a lot this morning, platforms, pedagogy, and community. And you know we've talked on about all of these terms a few times this morning. And what we tried to break down, and this is part of an article we're writing for Liz Loesch right now, is how do these three cross over? So the design of modular development for DS106, which I'll get into in a second, the course hub, the assignments bank, the daily create, the inspire, which I'll talk about, and the radio were platforms for people to come together and share. But they were also what informed, at least some of them, our notion of empowerment engagement, which was at the heart of why for this student. So they came there. And they also, in many ways, started to be what built a community. Because the idea of having this assignment bank that people can populate and then do allowed people to have this sense of, here's my reputation. I'm the baddest ass meme creator in DS106, and everyone on Twitter knows it. And that had nothing to do with the grade. Now, that also matters for this notion of aggregation and syndication. Aggregation and syndication allowed us to get out of the LMS. And it changed, in some ways, the technology that defined our pedagogy. right? And so what we started to think about in some really interesting ways is how DS-106 wasn't just about a platform or a pedagogy or a community, but it had elements that we really broke down and thought about how they cut across all three. Now, I couldn't do this in a 20-minute talk, but I just wanted to put this up there to kind of show you that this is something we've been thinking a lot about, about what that means and how we use platforms to foster community, but also vice versa. The three are constitutive. It's not just one gives birth to the next, which ultimately results in this. They're constantly always reinforcing each other in different ways. And that's really kind of cool for us to discover. Now, DS-106 started pretty much as a tweet, as most things do, I imagine, these days. And it was an idea of an online experiment to get to your kind of terminology. And it was purely an experiment. And I threw this out to my network, as you might call it. And the response from people like Alan Levine, Tom Woodward, Martha, and many, many others, Lisa Lane, who's in this room, Mikhail Gershevich, I mean, many people came together and started imagining this and what it might mean. And we started a, uh, Lebowski, I just love that, that, one of those great gifts where he's just moving his leg, thinking, <laughs> and that's the gift. Well, we got together about four days uh, before I went with my family to Italy, and we brainstormed what a connected course like DS-106 would look like. We'd already taught the class, or I'd already taught the class for a year, but there had been rumblings that people wanted to see this online, meaning they wanted to know how to set up their own domain. They wanted to know how to set up their own WordPress. They didn't care about animated GIFs. They didn't care, although they ultimately did, if I, you find out. <laughs> they didn't care about you know, four icon stories. They wanted some practical information about how to control their little bit of cyber infrastructure. So we said, well, let's invite people in. We did, and in the spring of 2011, um, we started an open laboratory called DS106. And this is what the course looks like now. It's gone through many revolutions. A lot of the design uh, goes uh, credited to um, Al Levine in terms of what this looks like now. He's done an unbelievable job. But this is an interesting point. And one of the things you'll, need, you'll see is here the open DS106 course and other DS106s. DS106 over the last four years has been taught at like 20 schools in different ways, mainly by adjunct, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. But it actually has taken off in Japan. It's big in Japan, as they say. <laughs> um, it's in Philadelphia, <laughs> in California, New York City. Um, different places at different times, Saudi Arabia. And it's just interesting because we haven't been so intentional, say, as FemTechNet about thinking about that. And I learned a lot from this morning's discussion um, to talk about that. But let's talk a little bit about how it works. Every student at Mary Washington, and say there's 25 in the class, go out and get their own domain and their own web hosting. They have their set, say they'll call it uh, jimgroom.com, or whatever you want to call it. 
They'll set that up. We'll give them the first week to play with that. And it's gotten to a point now that students can do it in a day or two, maybe less, an hour or two. It's amazing. It was one of the early experiments is like, can we do this? Is it possible? And I think the answer to that is yes. Students can do it with relative ease. And I think I have enough experience now of doing it with hundreds of students to say that's pretty much the case. That said, once they do, we have set up something between Martha and Alan where they drop their URL off at the DS106 aggregator hub, which we'll be doing for the connected courses by the end of this um, conference. And all the, the publishing they do shows up in a main central space. That's the aggregated hub. If I click on, say, this post, it will take me seamlessly to this person's post on their site. And that's the notion of aggregation and syndication. It's relatively simple. Using a plugin called Feed WordPress, it pulls all the distinct blogs into one. And that's your community. Very different from a closed content management system or LMS, it's actually an open aggregator of the work happening. And you can assign metadata to it, like what course, from what school, who did it, what assignment, what assignment did they do, um, did they do a tutorial? And so that got us thinking. And this is all Martha Burris, and she's rad. She started to think, OK, we have this. And DS106 had like 10 sacred assignments, right? It was like the video essay. Uh, what else was it? I forget even now. The audio story with just sound effects, nothing else. And these were like the 10 sacred assignments that I loved. Like, they were it. Well, turns out, Tom Woodward was like, that's probably, you did some good assignments, but they're probably not that good. <laughs> and your students could probably do much better. And as I always say, I cried. I listened to Morrissey. I cried some more. <laughs> I got over myself. And we actually built, Martha built, so that's a royal we. She built something along the lines of Ravelry. Now, any knitters? Any people who knit in the room? OK, if you're a knitter, Ravelry is an awesome site. It actually allows you to create a project, put it on there, and share it with potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of other people. Get feedback, and then they riff off yours. So it's a community for creation. It's closed, but my wife and I were kind of fans of Ravelry, so we saw it, and Martha was too. So we're like, what if we did something for the assignment bank based on Ravelry? So the assignment bank was basically inspired by an open website out there. And the assignment bank was, over the course of DS106, you have like seven or eight different assignments, like visual assignments, design assignments, audio, video, et cetera. It was really to get people to create. So you click on, say, for example, the design assignments, and you actually get a series of options. And what's cool about that is there's over 500 options, all submitted by students and open online participants. And we know, for example, that high schools and elementary schools all over the country and probably all over the world use some element of the DS-106 assignment bank to run particular elements of their course. So they're just teaching it. And I know this because I get emails from a ton of high school teachers and elementary <laughs> school teachers when it's down. <laughs> why is your course, why is your site down? I'm like, who the hell are you? <laughs> you know, it's weird. It's like, I can't believe it's down. <laughs> I am at dinner right now. My kid is screaming. I got her in one here. I got you in the... Okay, anyway. <laughs> so you'll see there's these all... People submit them. And a couple of things about the assignment bank, which is, I think, one of the coolest parts of this. You've got stars. And stars isn't quality. Stars is how difficult. Because every week or two, we give students, like, you have to do 20 stars. And you choose the assignments. And if you don't like the assignment you're given or you have to choose from, you create a new one. And that's kind of the participatory nature of DS-106. So you got the stars. You got 27 people who've completed this. So when you click on the assignment, you can see everyone else who's done it. And oftentimes, and this is all through tags in the aggregation system, you'll also be able to see tutorials for people who've done it. So you have assignments, you have people who've done the assignment, and then you have people who share with you how they did it. And so what's interesting is the assignment becomes one node on the hub of people aggregating around and thinking around and sharing. Some assignments have been done 200 times, some have been done two, some have 50 tutorials, some have none. So it's uneven, but it's interesting how we can start to see where the activity is happening. Now, 
The class is very self-reflexive, too. Too self-reflexive sometimes. But the assignments are actually about the class. Like, here's a propaganda course that one of the students created. Is I want to create World War II propaganda posters about DS-106. Building community, right? And so students get out, and they design this. And it's funny how it reinforces the actual logic of the class. And there's already almost built in this metacognition about the class's community. And the only way to build it is with comments, right? And you talked about that, Liz, like the idea of commenting and blogging. And when you have students creating propaganda posters that you must comment on posts, you know something good's happening, right? Like, I love the propaganda, and we'll get to that. The thing that tripped me out about DS-106 more than anything was, you can't see it, this says GIFs instead of oh. nerds. Right. GIFs took off for GIFs. This was 2011, and the year of the GIF was 2012. So we can say we were there before it broke big. But people wanted to know how to make an animated GIF. And before the class started in 2011, and Lisa Lane has done some amazing animated GIFs, People got on in December, so a month before the class started, literally, and they made 200 animated GIFs. And they shared over 15 tutorials on how to do it. And that was two weeks, three weeks before the class started. And we started to realize that providing a platform where people can share and create art and get feedback, whether it be on Twitter, on their blog, was something people were dying for. They, whether it was a class or not, they wanted to create someone and get someone else's feedback. And the class provided that model, but it wasn't limited to the class. And in fact, it went well beyond it and happened well before it, as the gifts were a perfect example. Um, I'm sorry, I need to go back. Now, you'll notice here, this is the assignment bank. This was that famous assignment, Say It Like Peanut Butter, which it took me, and I teach the class, it took me about an hour or no, a year to figure out what that meant. Say It Like Peanut Butter. It means whether it's GIF or GIF, yeah. GIF peanut butter. I couldn't figure that out. I was doing an assignment. I had no idea what the title meant. <laughs> and this is an interesting, and that's Wendy and The Shining shaking yeah. with the knife. But you'll notice here is where people, and this is um, Tom Woodward, would create tutorials early on before the class started. So we started using tags in this aggregation hub to bring everything in seamlessly. And you know, thinking about that, was really an interesting point. You know, it's like, oh, cool, the, you know, the assignment bank might be a little static, but it's really cool. I like it. But then trippy stuff started to happen. <laughs> stuff like the class started making Valentine's Day cards for each other. And DC Comic Valentine's Day cards, and when I show this, people are like, what? I grew, I'm born in 71. So about 78, 79, when I'm in like fourth or fifth grade, this stuff was like on my desk. Right? Like little Susie gave me one, or little Johnny gave me one. I was like, awesome. And then my kids are sending me Valentine's Day cards with that same cultural memorabilia. And that's a trip on your head. Like time has collapsed, and the web has brought what was unique in third grade to your tabletop. And this is a virtual one. So that was cool. And you know, we're a team, go DS 106, and it's 2011. But then it started to get trippy. People were doing weird ones. Like, you looked hotter online, and I was like, that's so uncool for Superman to say. And Sarah Coons, who made it, said, no way. That's what that's Wonder Woman is saying about yeah. Superman. Yeah. And so the whole kind of gender yeah. politics yeah. about meme yeah. culture started to explode. <laughs> and what happened is, this happened in 2011. That same student, and I'm going to break out of the presentation just for a second to show you this, and where that time-space continuum collapses a little bit, she was in Korea as a student who was teaching English, and she came back just for the Valentine's Day um, assignment to give the class a new assignment, to update it a year later. And she put all of, she created the assignment in the, a bank, she told them where to find it, and she started creating these new Valentine's Days. Baby, let's have some close encounters. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? So she created this, and the idea was you caption it. Can you feel the electricity between us? <laughs> That's too big, I guess. But <laughs> there's some good ones. See these guys? Looking down on the lovers. So I guess these were all special, and then, well, this is awkward angle to have a conversation. They <laughs> 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 got crazy. And then this is my favorite. Satan, why you make me choose today? <laughs> what and what? Isn't that body? 
I mean, I know it's hard to sit in front of a bunch of intellectuals and say that this is a course that you should think about modeling. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm really struck by the effects of community building this assignment bank had. So intense that this is not just a lawn with DS-106 mowed into it, which I'm not still sure how they did it, but it's a lawn in Melbourne, Australia, by Peter Rowe and Rowan Peter. And that really trips me out, because we gave a lot of options for people to, to um, kind of enter this community. And Peter entered through the radio, which I'll talk about in a second, or Rowan. This is, goes to your point, Anne, that you made earlier about the pop-up assignments, right? We had pop-up assignments, but we called them drive-by assignments. <laughs> right? People would go, like very boys in the hood. And this was a drive-by assignment. People would drop off four icon stories, and we'd be like, who did it? I have no idea. They'd just drop off the URL and roll. And I'm very much with you. I love that. Those are some of my favorites, because I just imagine stories. Like, Maybe this was, you know, Condoleezza Rice, and she just had an idea to create a quick form icon and didn't want to be, like, whoever it was, I was tripped out by it. And I thought it might have been George W. Bush Jr. because of the spelling <laughs> error, but anyway, that was cheap, I know. Okay, but the Daily Create. Now, keep in mind, this is actually something we're doing. We have the assignment bank, which is one part of it. Alan Levine kind of introduced me to this idea of the Daily Shoot. And the Daily Shoot was a site online, which I think is a brilliant pedagogical site to think about. You would take an image based on a particular assignment. Like for the last Daily Shoot assignment, make a photograph today that is important to you. One that says what you want to say. Someone would take the photo, would upload it with two tags, and that would come there. And when you went to see your photo, it was immediately in context of everyone else who'd taken that photo for them. And it was interesting through this to start to see the notion of context and community and juxtaposition as a way to learn by osmosis. And I thought it was such a brilliant design. The problem with it is that they stopped. The two photographers who ran it had run it to their course. They wanted to move on to different things. So Alan Levine said, and Tim Owens and Martha Burtis, said, you know what, let's run our own. So they actually built the Daily Create for DS-106 that was about the daily habit of creation. Photography, video, audio, storytelling, which is kind of short narrative, every day you would get a different prompt. And this prompt would make a photo based on the idea of dozen or 12. And people in the class would, and you would have that same effect of learning about people's stories based on that one single image they took. And I was deeply fascinated by it. Now, the infrastructure platform starts to represent the pedagogy in some powerful ways Especially when your students come to you and they say they want to create a site as part of the DS-106 kind of now. It's an empire, right? It's got radio. <laughs> it's got an assignment bank. It's got a daily create. This is the inspire that two students said for their final project. They wanted to create a site using forms where people could submit the work in DS-106 that has inspired them up to date. So this was a place where students were paying homage to the work that inspired them. And this was all part of them building the infrastructure of the site. DS-106 Radio, there could be an entire series of presentations about this community alone. People like Grant Potter, um, who you can kind of see here, maybe not. Um, well, Grant Potter, they're going to play the video. That's him playing in his Grant Parsons shirt. And it's a beautiful shirt, but I, won't, uh, I don't have time to get beyond that. Grant Potter kind of started this community. Um, he got us up to get uh, up with a with a radio station. The reason why we had a radio was we didn't want to use blackboard. We didn't want DS106 to find itself on the confines of a blackboard where it's like, come on, eat your donuts. Why aren't you eating your donuts? Right? Like we felt like it was such a closed, you know, talk about aesthetics, this closed fluorescent-lighted system we didn't want to be a part of. So he set up this open source radio. And people started broadcasting. They started sharing the music that they love. They started coming on with their devices, whatever device, and saying, hey, here I am in Australia. Listen to the locusts. And it's mid-February here in uh, Virginia, but I'm listening to locusts in Melbourne. And it was this weird moment where those devices became connection tools about time and space and collapsing them. And it was really powerful. 
There's a, a character who's actually in this room who will not be named, although you'll be able to recognize him in a second, who would get on TV and tell his narrative of coming from the Soviet Union to California and what that means. And his mother is a natural radio presence. Oh, Misha, when you came and I listened to Stalin and then drinking vodka and you can hear the glasses clink. And there are years of family narratives that are playing out in these 15, 20 minute sessions about people. And so DS-106 Radio wasn't about necessarily projecting a course. It was about people telling their life story. It was about them connecting with you around their mom and the story that has dominated the narrative of their family, the coming to America as Soviets, was a powerful reminder that we're underutilizing the technology for the sake of efficiency. And we're losing so much in the relation or in the exchange. DS-106 and Twitter, I can't say enough about how that community has coexisted. As much as I love blogging, and I do, and as much as I love um, the DS-106 hub, DS-106 on Twitter is what has kept that sense of consistency and permanence and persistence around the community going. Up and until now, if you look at that hashtag, it is still very active. And there is no community organization. People are just doing it. Um, so much to a point that one of the students in week three of 2011 created a bot on, um, DS1, on Twitter so that every time a new song came on, um, DS106 radio, it would have a tweet. So basically, every time we broke the law with putting <laughs> copyrighted material, we documented it. <laughs> like, which is, you know, kind of an interesting, hey, you know, flip the bird at all questions of property and copyright. And I remember being hunkered in my kitchen on the phone with Brian Lamb saying, are you sure you really want to let your student pull the trigger on a Twitter bot that will record every single time we infringe copyright? And I was like, I felt scared. But I was like, I kind of do. <laughs> because if we at the university aren't thinking about where we are and where we stand in relationship to our culture and ownership, then we're not doing our job. And DS-106 was that without the edge of punk rhetoric. It was practice. It was pushing it out. It was coming together. And it was everybody doing it. Now, it's also reassuring to know that we're so small and insignificant that no one cared and no one noticed. <laughs> because we still know that we can move beneath that. And this is the post of Aaron who created that Twitter bot. And this is week three. And, you know, talk about, you know, learning. He was a graduate or a senior computer science student who could actually bring his skills to bear right away in building that sense of community. And I was always struck by that. What came out of it, too, was a TV station. Um, we went on to create something called DTLT Today with some video, which I thought was really compelling. We had a Minecraft server early on that no one minded, but people just went in there and created stuff. They created, a, uh, one of my favorite was a roller coaster. Um, they created DS-106 iconography. And just basically had fun. But it was probably the coolest, and Helen and I were talking about like moments in teaching that we're trying to return to, and I'm still trying to return to this notion of the summer of oblivion. Anyone a fan of Cronenberg? Right? Cronenberg, right? Big fan. Videodrome, basically. Cronenberg, I didn't realize, was a student of uh, Malcolm uh, uh, McLuhan. No, why am I getting Marshall McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan. And he didn't know this, but the, the character of Brian Oblivion in Videodrome was inspired by McLuhan. And M Brian Oblivion is this character that I was fascinated by. For 27 years, he had never talked to anyone except mediated through television. So he would go on a television talk show as a talking head television. So he would put a television in the seat and he'd be talking to the crowd through a television on television, right? Like conception television stuff. And I was, so I was like, what if we taught DS-106 that Brian Oblivion is now Dr. Oblivion. He's a professor, and he's teaching the class, but he's never dealt with a student face-to-face -face for 26 years. Joke being the web hasn't been around for 26 years, but that was the idea. So Dr. Oblivion came to life. I shaved my head to look like Brian Oblivion, and I started a class online, a five-week class, with the idea of Brian Oblivion. And it so freaked me out by day three, 
like I had shaved my head, I came down. Aunt Vanella, who's my special lady friend, was like, why is your head shaved? My teachers were saying, what's going on with you, Dr. Oblivion? I was not allowed to sleep in my own bed. It was trippy, and I really had an identity crisis, which is not necessarily new for me, but this one was extreme. So I had to go missing, and I did. And what happened is people started riffing on it, so they created tweet sightings. And Martha Burtis was like, what if we turn your mental anguish into part of the narrative <laughs> of the story. You go missing, and then the TA Jim Groom comes on and starts teaching the class. And we moved for the next five weeks. Jim Groom went missing, then Andy Rush, who works with me, became Dr. Oblivion slowly over time. <laughs> Turns out Martha Burtis was the one who was, and we had jumped the shark at this point, who had had kidnapped Dr. Oblivion and Jim Groom because she got looked over for the TA ship. So what we were doing as an ed tech staff is we became kind of sitcom writers. <laughs> and the thing is, is the community out there was playing off of us. And the students were learning. To the point, and I know I'm over time, so cut me off at any point, to the point where students start to get into the narrative and create it. This is another propaganda series um, called News on the March, created by Alan Liddell, who I love. Um, he had just come back from Afghanistan. And he was very compelled by this idea of propaganda. So when Dr. Oblivion went missing and Jim Groom became a tyrant, and he did become a tyrant and started banishing students from the class, he documented it in this kind of daily news on the march. And here's one particular one. On the march. Sectionalism rocks the Oblivion campus. TA Jim Groom goes mad with power and banishes DS-106ers en masse. The family of Libyan bickers while DS-106 burns, and so clearly new leadership is needed. The first martyr to the cause after the Oblivions is Araba, who was banished from DS-106 after questioning Grimm's seemingly absolute authority. So let it be noted in the annals of history that DS-106 is hereby dissolved, its power over our minds illusory, and its message of total student domination illegitimate. From the ashes of DS-106 arises a new order, DS-107, led by none, controlled by none, for the benefit of all who seek relief from the oppression of the TA. We are the true heirs of the legacy of Dr. Oblivion, and we declare before the world that our purpose is to depose the monster and see him displayed in chains for all to see. With that in mind, carry on the legacy of Dr. Oblivion with your radio and video assignments, as we wait in joyful hope for his return to us. With Oblivion on our side, we cannot fail. And to all enemies of DS-107, seek not to bar our way, for we shall win through, no matter the cost. Okay, so a little context. Jim Broom has basically gone missing. He had been banishing students. And this student comes in and says, I'm going to make play with the narrative and create this news on the march. And then factionalism started. There was those who supported Jim Broom, <laughs> DS-106ers, and then DS-107, who, suppo who supported the now missing presence of Dr. Oblivion. And I'm not obviously suggesting this is a model you, and this is where it was all documented, um, in a storify. And there's really an amazing trail of, a tale of the tape, really. Um, and I'm not suggesting that I can ever, like, suggest that, okay, I plan to shave my head and do this course, and this is going to help. It was completely unplanned in terms of where it would go. But it was open, and it was pretty magical in that. And one of the things I started to realize with this class is, one of the things you can do is maybe not trying to reproduce what you always did so it became old, but start playing with the idea of themes around the narrative. And so the next summer, we played with the notion of DS-106 Zone, where it was about Twilight Zone inspired. And this is where it gets crazy. So there's a guy, Andrew Forgrave, who is up in Ontario. He gets a talky Tina doll. And he starts creating a site with the identity of Talky Tina and commenting on students' blogs <laughs> as if it's Talky Tina. Like, I'm your special friend. Am I your friend? Are you my friend? And students are like, what the hell is happening? And he is playing it. Like, he is like images like this, the icon, the site. And he was making badges like, are you my special friend? And if you were, you could put the badge in your sidebar. And if you weren't, you have to worry about was Talkie Tina going to show up in your garbage can one night. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know Talkie Tina, that's the famous episode of Twilight Zone where Telly Savalas is kind of, get rid of this doll, throws it away, and then the doll comes back and kills Telly Savalas. And Telly Savalas is a bad man anyway. 
So this is actually interesting because all of the art in the class was dedicated to Twilight Zone. So this was a Twilight Zone um, book cover, and then someone remixed it to be used that to create an Atari 2600 cover. And the Simon Bank started to explode with different riffs. Someone did this of the invader in Excel, which I think is really cool. Um, and then this is actually a bill for how much the spaceship that was destroyed cost. And it's actually Robert McNamara who set up the bill to tell the story. And I love it. It's like January 27, 1961 was significantly damaged. And they told the story of that episode in the form of a bill, which I was kind of tripped out by. And then the animated gifts, they never stop. The book covers, um, another book cover. Uh, people were playing on the idea of, uh, of the Midnight Sun. And this would be her gallery, because she was an artist, and she had these two. And so they actually imagined what an opening for her artwork would look like. And it brings me back to the why, right? DS-106 kind of, I don't, can't say I had a roadmap for any of what happened. And I can't say I did it alone. And I hope it made clear just how many people made this community and culture as powerful and as engaging as it was. But I do think coming back to what Mike kind of set up for me yesterday is those three questions of the why and why this was important to me and why I want to push on with it, I think start to kind of, for me, move to why I want to be here and why I think connected courses are powerful and why I think the idea of empowering people to have their own space online to create and to share and to create networks that move well beyond school and move well beyond our traditional notions of the class and time and space is really a powerful thing we got to stick on and we got to push hard on. And I don't necessarily think these objectives, and I'm not married to them, but they've kind of served me well. And I didn't really reflect on them until last night when I started to think about why did I do DS-106 again? I did it for personal reasons to escape the notion of edupunk. I did it for personal reasons to kind of revisit whether a personal cyber infrastructure was possible and scalable. And Gardner Campbell said, and I agree with this, the only thing that scales online is the individual. And so we have to empower them to create the system to scale. And the other reason I did it is I wanted to have fun again. Right? I wanted to be able to play. And I wanted when someone did a stupid animated GIF about a little invader with a knife, I wanted to be able to laugh and give someone credit for that. And I don't know still where DS-106 squares with the notion of high red. And I like that I still can't square the two. I think that, for me, is what keeps me excited about it. And so I'm teaching it again in the fall. But in the fall, rather than doing Twilight Zone or Oblivion, we're going to do The Wire. Uh, so the whole class is going to be dedicated to watching and remixing The Wire and talk about some of the deeper sociological and infrastructural problems we have in this country, and how do we make a story about it? And for me, it's a way to talk about something that no one would let me teach otherwise. So it's also, at its base, a subversive act, I want to believe, but not one I want to carry a flag around with, one I want to have fun with. So it's an interesting thing, and I appreciate you listening to me rant half an hour more and how it has not stopped me than what I should have. So. <laughs>